Space has become an integral part of warfighting, and similar to the creation of the U.S. Space Force, the United Kingdom created the U.K. Space Command. The commander, Air Vice Marshal Paul Godfrey, is in Washington for meetings with senior defense leaders. Paul, welcome to the program. Thank you. Great to be here, Mimi. I would call you Air Vice Marshal, but it's a little bit uh, go with Paul. <laughs> clunky. <laughs> Um, your command was created uh, a little over a year ago in yeah. April of 2021. What was the motivation for that creation? Well, there was a couple of things. If I take back to 2019, there was a point there where NATO actually declared space an operational domain. And interestingly, at the same time in the, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, we were running through an election and the Conservative Party had stated in their manifesto that if they were elected, they would form a, a UK space command. So at that point, our Ministry of Defense, uh, they created what we termed the Space Directorate, just to bring a focal point to space in defense, because there'd been little sort of pockets of space brilliance around the place. And as we went through our, what we term integrated re review, a bit like the quadrennial review, um, they essentially stated the case for space, which ultimately resulted in us forming just over a year ago on the uh, on the 1st of April. And US Space Force had already been created at the time, so that was probably an additional motivation. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, if you go back to that declaration of space as a as an operational domain, um, I think it was because everything that is happening in space in terms of it being a congested first of all with debris, the amount of satellites that are now going up there as well, but also the the contested aspects of space. Um, and as cyber and space had, had become, you know, the additional domains on top of uh, airland and uh, maritime. Um, it was it was the right thing to do. And, it, and I'll tell you what, it has been a fascinating year for us. Well, tell me what you've accomplished so far. I mean, besides getting, you know, office, uh, <laughs> your, your office set up. Well, you smile. That, that, uh, some of that stuff was was some of the biggest things that we had to do. You know, I thought if if you just look at that timeline, so our, the MOD Space Directorate was only formed at the beginning of 2020, and it was only a year later at the output of our integrated review on the 6th of January that the order was signed to form Space Command. So on the 31st of March, there were six of us. Um, actually, on the 1st of April, because we inherited a couple of organizations and people uh, and guys and girls that were already doing space, on day one, I looked at just around 400 people um, who all looked at me wondering where we were going to go. And, and you've achieved initial operating capability. Yeah. What does that mean? What are you actually capable of doing right, right. now? Right. So the reason we inherited that 400 people is that we were already doing space operations. So we have a collaborative UK-US radar that uh, is ballistic missile early warning, but also does space main awareness. We have a space operations center, so we do operations. The new things that I was tasked with doing is the capability program. So we got a billion and a half plus uh, for new space capability. We had about five and a half billion for satellite communications. I'm also tasked with doing um, space education and training, not just for the command and everything that we do, but for wider defense as well. So when we got to IOC, that's when we started taking on those capability programs for the future. So talk about your collaboration with the US military. What are you actually doing together? Uh, the, so clearly it's a collaboration that goes back years. I myself flew with the United States Air Force for three years between 2000 and 2003, so, you know, so I understand the importance. The US is that allied global leader in space. So, you know, Although we don't have the budgets that you guys do, I've got to make sure that where we go in capability terms, um, we really do add value. So a lot of the discussions are about understanding where the US is going, where we can add value, and with the wider partners as well, the allies and partners from Five Eyes through a combined space op uh, operations and with NATO as well. So there's an awful lot that we need to do. Let's drill down a little bit on that because in April you signed a memorandum of understanding with US Space Command, that's uh, General Dickinson. Yes. Um, what practical outcomes will that have? Well, so actually there was a practical outcome this week. So it's interesting because as a, a small organization as we are, um, I touch into US Space Force and organize, train and equip, as they call it, and US Space Command from the operations side. So one of the first things that we did, we put a, a one-star Brigadier General from the UK Army, we're a joint organization, into US Space Command. 
And actually that memorandum of understanding um, allows us now to look at where we're going in the future and how we collaborate. And actually one of the things that has accelerated that collaboration has been the, uh, from February the 24th this year, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So this week actually we've had combined talks which were the first level underneath that agreement to see exactly how we're going to integrate and where we go in the future. You know, you're you're um, in Washington for meetings with defense officials and your counterparts, but you're also meeting with American tech companies. Yeah. What are you looking for from them? So that's to do with the capability program that I've got to run. If you look at the billion and a half we've got, uh, a billion of that is for what we term ISR, Earth observation. And I think Ukraine has shown how incredibly important that is. And actually, the company we went to see yesterday was Maxar um, uh, to understand how they do their ISR um, how we might leverage some of the things that they do and, and actually look at the lessons that they've learned as well. We've got a mantra through our defense space strategy, which is own, collaborate and access. So we need to understand what we're going to own, what sovereign capabilities do we need. We've done that with satellite communications already. Who are we going to collaborate with and what do we just buy commercially as well? So a lot of my last year has been out and about talking through uh, all of these things with uh, with hundreds, actually, of different space companies, and clearly some of the bigger ones sit here, over here in the U.S. What's the biggest thing you're looking for from your relationship with the U.S.? Is it is it that technology transfer? Is it um, is it something more? Um, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Honestly, it's to ensure that we add value. As I say, the U.S. is the global allied leader in space, and. So I could go off and spend that billion and a half on all sorts of different things. But if uh, I talk about it being a, you know, our, our, our little cog, and if we can put our little cog in the U.S. machine in exactly the right place, it will make it more efficient, you know, and we can work with other allies and partners in order to do that. You know, ultimately, because of the threats that are building in the space domain, the U.S. can't do this alone. So, you know, it's about that sort of collaboration. I just want to add value. We're going to take a quick pause, and then we'll come back. Coming next on Government Matters, I'll continue the conversation with Air Vice Marshal Paul Godfrey, Commander of UK Space Command. Stay with us. I'm back with Air Vice Marshal Paul Godfrey, the Commander of UK's Space Command. Paul, you started talking a little bit about the threats and, and space as a contested domain. Russia tested an anti-satellite um, missile in November of last year. What was your reaction to that? You know, that was one of the more difficult things we've had to deal with. Bear in mind that we were a, a, an organization early in our, in our builder. Um, so it was really interesting. The 15th of November, I remember it well. Um, we knew that something may be happening, but just to see Russia actually hit that satellite, over 1,500 pieces of trackable debris. If I go back, our vision is to make space safe, secure, and sustainable for all generations. That is not what you do in terms of sustainable space. Um, so for us... And was that because of the debris or was that because of the capability of hitting a satellite and destroying it? Well, I think it's both. You know, A, to understand the, the sorts of capabilities that, that Russia or potential adversaries have got, but B, just that point about creating debris in space. And, you know, I think it was shown to the world the day after when um, NASA played the the, uh, uh, the tape of Houston talking to the International Space Station and telling the astronauts and cosmonauts in there to get into their life boats, if you like, the you know, escape craft, for want of a better word, because they didn't know what this debris field was going to do or how, how close it was going. So it was a, a, a sort of global interest item demonstrating just how important space is to us and how contested it is right now. So what is the UK doing to protect your assets in space? So that's my prime remit, actually, is, is to do with protect and defend. Our, our national space strategy was released last year. And amongst some of the goals in there, one is protect and defend. So out of those in our defense strategy, uh, the first one is protect and defend our assets. So the number one priority for me is what we term space domain awareness. It's understanding what is going on out in that environment. And that's very much where the UK-US collaboration and the allied collaboration comes in so that we're all looking at the same thing in space and all using our different sensors to build that picture of what's going on. Well, let's talk about the uh, war in Ukraine. What are you all doing to support that effort? So from a, it, it was interesting from a UK Space Command perspective, because of 
the operations teams that we inherited, they also do a ballistic missile early warning role. And just to see, you know, almost 100 ballistic missiles launched in that first evening on the 24th of February this year really brings it home as to, you know, the, um, the effect that Russia was having in Ukraine. From then on, we've been monitoring, we've been looking and seeing what's going on in space. Um, and it's been interesting as well to see the space domain in the news. If you look at Elon Musk providing Starlink terminals, basically to get the internet back up and running in Ukraine, I think we're learning the lessons as we go at the moment, but it's been fascinating to see how all of this has played out and, and changing what we think we may need to do in the future. You know, I, I ask um, military, American military leaders this all the time, which is what are the lessons that you're taking from watching this war unfold? I wonder what your perspective is on that. Um, as I say, you know, I've, we've been watching with interest in terms of the, the way that satellite communications uh, have been used throughout this. That my point about Elon Musk there and, the, and uh, Starlink as a company. Um, it's really interesting. Whenever I give speeches, we talk about how space matters and how space, particularly when you get to what we would term GPS, but position, navigation and timing is just embedded in our current culture. You know, we, you, you can't do It's everyday life. It's everyday life, especially that timing signal. If you look at traffic lights, you look at safety, you look at all of ATMs, banking, everything is reliant on that timing signal. And I think, you know, it's been in the news when that signal is easily jammed. It's one of those things that you now need to understand, A, from a, a US perspective, how do we collectively protect the, the GPS constellation that's there? And B, what are the alternatives for the future to ensure that, we, you know, this is a resilient network? You know, the UK doesn't seem to have been too involved in space historically. Can you, especially compared to the US, can yeah. you give us a very brief history of what uh, the UK's history is in space? Yeah, no, you're right. Um, it comes down to budgets, I think, at the end of the day. You know, clearly the, 19, it always, yeah, the <laughs> 1960s was, uh, was a big deal with the space race uh, from a US perspective. But the UK was involved early on, you know, the, with the Russians, with Sputnik and the first satellite, then the US. Actually, the, not many people know the UK was the third nation to then put a, uh, a satellite in orbit in, uh, in 1962. And actually, we were the first nation to put up a military satellite communications satellite in geostationary orbit in 1969 as well. So we've kind of been there in the background. But when it comes to the sort of the human space flight aspects of this, um, no, we, we haven't been involved. But 2010, the UK formed the UK Space Agency. I think now is the time where we're looking at our future capability. And as I say, you know, if you add up the billion and a half and five and a half billion for SATCOM, then we, you know, we're upwards of seven billion, so $10 billion over the next 10 years, um, which is, uh, is a great place to be, to, to be able to collaborate in the space domain. And are you expecting more uh, involvement and more investment, importantly, in space for the UK? I think one of the really good things, I mentioned 2019, it, there was the Conservative Party had this as part of their manifesto. So the really interesting thing is that this is led from the top down. So our National Space Council is chaired by the Prime Minister. And I speak regularly, weekly, with my civilian counterparts in different uh, government agencies and also the UK Space Agency. And so it is much broader than defense. So from a UK perspective, it's about supercharging the space enterprise in the UK. I think if we get that right, that'll you know, increase investment in the community. One thing we're really looking forward to is the first space launch from the UK using Virgin Orbit um, later on this summer, which we will have a, a, an MOD payload on. So it's a really exciting future. Well, I, you know, we're out of time, but I just want to know, what's your favorite thing about visiting DC? Oh, there's so much. Um, we were talking earlier, actually one of my favorite things is seeing it from the ground. I was, I flew a combat air patrol post 9-11 when I was on exchange with the United States Air Force. And, you know, seeing the most powerful nation on earth and the capital of that as the sun came up on, uh, on Thanksgiving in 2001. It, it is just a beautiful city. It makes me proud to be able to walk around it down here, you know, so I think it's every single part of it. Thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.